In the midst of a year defined by the leadership of President George W. Bush and the chatter surrounding the animated hit Happy Feet, a tragic event unraveled in Auburn, Alabama. It was the year 2006, where the world grappled with the tragic loss of renowned adventurer and wildlife expert Steve Irwin, known fondly as the Crocodile Hunter. However, amidst these global distractions, a bone-chilling crime unfolded on June 10th, casting a dark shadow over this seemingly ordinary town. What should have been a normal movie date with her closest friend turned into a nightmare when Lorianne Slasinski vanished into thin air that night, leaving her loved ones searching for answers and fearing the unimaginable. With the discovery of her car found engulfed in flames four days after she disappeared, the world asked themselves the same question. Where is Lori? Welcome back to the chilling realm of the Detectiverse, where we voyage deep into the world of solved and unsolved crimes and spine-chilling mysteries that will keep you up at night. In today's video, we will dive into the case of Lori Ann Slasinski, exploring the details of her disappearance and the efforts to find her. Join us as we unravel the sequence of events that transpired and how her killer was finally caught. Without further ado, let's dive into the story. On September 21, 1981, a beautiful baby girl named Lori Ann Slasinski was born in New York. Her parents were Arlene and Casey Slasinski. When Lori was just 13, her parents decided to leave the bustling state of New York and start a new chapter of their lives in the tranquil countryside of Alabama. Lori was a curious child, always eager to learn and explore. Her parents recognized her love for education early on and supported her dreams. They even bought her a mobile home near Auburn University, where she lived off campus in a popular trailer park for students. At Auburn University, Lori studied psychology and criminal justice, which became her passion. She excelled in her studies and graduated with honors in 2004. It was there that Lori met her best friend, Lindsey Braun. They bonded over their mutual love for helping others and decided to work together at a local mental health facility after graduation. But Lori's kind heart wasn't limited to her work. She loved animals and always had a furry friend by her side. Her beloved dog, Peanut, was her constant companion. When she wasn't spending time with animals, Lori was dedicated to her studies. She was a hardworking student who never backed down from a challenge. Even outside of her academic life, Lori was known for her warm personality and infectious smile. She had piercing blue eyes and beautiful blonde hair. Her ears were always adorned with earrings, and her spirit was as vibrant as her appearance. One of Lori's close acquaintances was Daryl Richard Ennis. She had met him at a local bowling alley where Ennis worked. Sometime in late 2005, Lori asked her mother if Ennis could join their family for Christmas. Without any hesitation, her mother agreed. Lori felt bad for Ennis, apparently. He had no family to spend the holidays with. Lori and Ennis spent a lot of time together. It wasn't long before they became good friends. Lori was living life to the fullest, but little did she know that a dark cloud was looming over her. In the blink of an eye, her world turned upside down and darkness descended upon her. On June 10, 2006, Lori was excited to spend a fun evening with her best friend, Lindsay Braun. They planned to have drinks and watch movies at Braun's house. Lori called Braun around 6.30 p.m. and informed her that she had to stop at the store, then she would be right over. It was planned to be an enjoyable girls' night out. But something strange happened. Braun waited for her, but Lori didn't show up. Braun eventually became worried. The next day, Braun tried calling Lori's house but got no answer. She left many voicemails but still no response. Braun's worry turned into panic when Lori didn't show up to work for a second day in a row. She rushed to Lori's home to check on her but found no sign of her. The only one at the home was her beloved dog Peanut in his crate. Braun noticed something strange. The crate was spotless and Peanut seemed well-fed and happy, as though someone had taken care of him. Braun then noticed that Lori's rugs were missing, as well as her trash can sitting outside which contained her yard tools. Even more alarming, the answering machine had been unplugged and all the messages had been deleted. By this time, Lori's mother had also become worried after Lori failed to answer her phone. When she arrived at Lori's home, she was nowhere to be found. Panic set in and her mother contacted the police. June 13, 2006 marked the beginning of a harrowing journey for Lori's family as they filed a missing person report for their beloved daughter. 
Initially, the Alabama police treated Lori's disappearance as a typical missing person case. However, things turned dark when they arrived at Lori's trailer and discovered signs of forced entry at the front door. Scuff marks on the hallway walls suggested a possible struggle had taken place. Police discovered semen on Lori's bedsheet and traces of blood were found on the doorknob. A golden hoop earring and coat hanger were also found at the scene. Authorities would soon retrieve video footage from June 10, 2006, showing Lori shopping at a nearby Alabama Walmart. That was the last known sighting of Lori. Lori's family was helpless and could only wait for her to return. Finally, on June 13, the phone rang, but it wasn't Lori on the other end. Instead, it was her friend, 25-year-old Rick Ennis. He told Lori's mother that he had seen Lori the day before she went missing and that Lori had gone to make a big drug deal. Lori's mother was devastated and refused to believe this. She insisted that her daughter would never do such a thing. She knew Ennis was lying but had no idea why. Ennis also told the police that they grew marijuana together and that Lori may have gone off to make a drug deal with some shady characters. However, when authorities searched Lori's trailer, they found no evidence to support Ennis's claims. On June 14th, the investigation into Lori's disappearance took a dark turn with significant development. Lori's car, a blue 2005 Mazda Tribute, was discovered abandoned and actively burning in the roadway on DeKalb Street. This shocking discovery was made just before dawn, and it sent shockwaves through the community. The location where Lori's car was found was in a cul-de-sac outside a construction site not far from her home. The site was nothing short of a nightmare. The authorities immediately launched an investigation, and they sent the car to a forensics lab for analysis. The lab report later revealed that Lori's blood was on the car door. This added to the growing concern that something terrible had happened to her. As investigators combed the area for clues, they found a hand-rolled cigarette near the car and a gasoline container in the nearby woods. The similarities between the gas can found and the one missing from Ennis's workplace raised more questions than answers. The question on everyone's mind was, who would set her car on fire? And why? The investigation took a sharp turn from a missing person case to a potential homicide investigation. Detectives focused their attention on Ennis, who not only knew Lori, but was also one of the last people to see her alive. When he was confronted by police, detectives noticed scratches on his arms and hands, which he failed to explain. It felt as if there were many holes in Ennis's story. Authorities were convinced he was hiding something and were determined to uncover the truth. The stakes were high and time was running out. The revelation of Ennis's chilling past caused ripples through the investigation. A man who had already taken the lives of his own mother and stepfather was now a suspect in Lori Slasinski's disappearance. His mother, Dolly Flowers, was shot and beaten with a baseball bat. Ennis placed a rose on her chest and covered her face with a velvet shawl after he killed her. His stepfather, Eddie Joe Flowers, known as Elvis, was also shot in the face with a shotgun. Ennis's excuse for committing these gruesome murders in 1993 was he was just angry about his parents planning to move and he didn't want to leave his school. But what was even more disturbing was that investigators found a to-do list on Ennis that included killing his three stepsisters. Ennis had committed these heinous crimes as a young boy, only 12 years old at the time. He spent nine years in juvenile detention before being released at the age of 21. But it seemed that his violent tendencies had not faded away over time. Instead, it was a dark and twisted past that added a new level of horror to the already mysterious disappearance of Lori Slasinski. As the investigation into Lori's disappearance continued, a new piece of information emerged. Lindsay Brown, Lori's friend, revealed that Lori had received a love letter from Ennis. However, Lori had made it clear that she was not interested in him romantically and planned to talk to him about it. Ennis admitted to writing the letter, and investigators discovered that he had also told friends about Lori rejecting him. This led investigators to search his car, where they found a knife, handcuffs, and cleaning supplies. Ennis was the prime suspect in the case, but authorities could not make an arrest without direct evidence or a found body. After being requestioned by police, Ennis vanished from Auburn, and Lori's case went cold. The investigation had hit a frustrating dead end, and Lori's loved ones were left to wonder if they would ever find answers. It's said that justice may be delayed, but it is never denied. And in the case of Lori Slasinski, 
it took 16 years for the wheels of justice to start turning again. Thanks to the tireless efforts of Special Agent Mark Whitaker, a cold case unit was established and Lori's case was reopened. After combing through the evidence, they came to the same conclusion that previous investigators had. Ennis was their prime suspect. But this time, they had a crucial piece of evidence that could open the case. A 2007 forensic report showed that Ennis's DNA was found on semen and blood at the scene of Lori's disappearance. With this evidence, the cold case unit built a strong case against Ennis. With the help of a former roommate of Ennis, they were able to recover three rugs that were missing from Lori's trailer, and one of them was found to have Ennis' blood on it. The case was finally coming together, and it was only a matter of time before Ennis would face the consequences for his actions. After a long and arduous investigation spanning over a decade, justice had finally caught up with Ennis. The man who had managed to evade the law for years, moving from place to place, finally found himself behind bars. Ennis had been tracked down to a small town in Virginia, where he was living a seemingly normal life, engaged to a school librarian and working for a company that made portable living structures. His past had caught up with him, and on his 38th birthday, a task force of U.S. Marshals swooped in to arrest him. Ennis was charged with two counts of capital murder, one for burglary and the other for kidnapping. The wheels of justice were turning, and the process of transferring him back to Alabama was already underway. During all this, Lori's family was going through a huge loss. Arlene had already suffered the pain of losing her daughter Lori, and life had not been so giving to the Slisinski family. Her son Paul passed away soon after Ennis's arrest, and her husband Casey became terminally ill in 2020, leaving Arlene with an unbearable amount of grief. Finally, the case of Lori Slisinski's disappearance finally came to the forefront in March 2022. The trial began, but prosecutors were not allowed to bring up Ennis's previous conviction for killing his parents. However, in an exclusive interview with correspondent Peter Van Sant, Ennis spoke candidly about his past, claiming that he killed his parents because he was abused by his mother and not because he didn't want to move, a different story than what he had previously stated. Despite Ennis' claims, no evidence was found to corroborate his allegations. As for Lori's case, Ennis maintained his innocence, describing her as a close and dear friend and saying that he would never have hurt her. The trial of Rick Ennis was a battle between the prosecution's overwhelming evidence and the defense's attempts to discredit it. Prosecutors presented a wealth of evidence that appeared to tie Ennis to Lori Slisinski's disappearance and murder, including his semen found inside her trailer and his DNA on a cigarette butt at the scene of her burned-out car. Knives and handcuffs were also found in Ennis's vehicle, and scratches on his arm suggested a struggle with Slisinski. But the defense attempted to poke holes in the prosecution's case. They argued that police could have planted the cigarette butt. Ennis himself testified, denying any involvement in Slisinski's disappearance and claiming that the scratches on his arm were caused by his dog. He insisted that the rugs were purchased at Target and had nothing to do with Lori. In the end, the jury would have to weigh the evidence and decide whether Ennis was guilty or not. After a long trial and two days of deliberation, justice was finally served for Lori Slisinski. Ennis was found guilty of her murder and faced the possibility of the death penalty. However, in a compassionate move, Lori's mother and the DA agreed to take the death penalty off the table. So, Ennis was sentenced to life without parole, which ensured that he would never walk free again. The murder of Lori Slisinski shocked the small town of Auburn, Alabama, and her disappearance still has unanswered questions that may never be solved. Lori's body has never been found. When the prosecutor asked Ennis, where did you dump Lori's body? Ennis confidently looked up and stated, he had nothing to do with her disappearance. Will we ever know the answer to this question? Let us know your thoughts down below.